big joke, and anybody who does speak out, and, and Jesse Jackson, and, and any teachers that I had in college who were speaking out like this, and they were always made into clowns, or if they were taken seriously, they were removed, and we weren't able to have the opportunity to hear what they had to say. What school was that? Well, I'm asking you. It what, could have been in a number school of schools. Well, there's been an, a lot of purging in the universities uh, of people. Teacher, how you My personal experience as a teacher has been one of unmitigated oppression in the sense of losing jobs and being denied jobs, being turned down by departments where I outpublished the whole department. You know, the rule was publish or perish, and if you publish, you're rewarded with appointments in advance. I outpublished, I mean, not, not every individual in the department, I outpublished the whole department if you add up all their publications put together. I have about 140 articles and eight books and all. I would, I've been turned down by political science departments that um, would normally, if I were a mainstream political scientist, would have snatched me up with my credentials. So that kind of thing goes on uh, all, all the time. Uh, the worst attacks on my person and my physical safety came on a university campus by campus police and state troopers in Illinois during the Kent State Uprising, where I was beaten to a pulp, my head covered with blood, and uh, thrown to prison and sentenced to two years uh, for mob action and uh, uh, assault and battery. It was during the anti-war demonstration days. And uh, I remember s sitting in the prison and hearing one of the cops outside say, that's Parenti. Now the chancellor will want us to throw the book at him. And they did, and, and, and they, we had a, a judge trial. I didn't go to prison. I didn't serve it. I had, did, did two years of probation because I was out of town and I was already at another school. But I never, never really got tenure and um, was always pounded in that way. The students, I found, were, were often open to the message. It depended on where. Uh, some schools, they weren't. Uh, some of them, um, uh, when you get to the really well-to-do, elite, careerist kids, they, uh, they often um, could, could be very unreceptive. But it varied from place to place. But it's hard for me to say. I say there's a lot of people on campus who are receptive if if approached in the right way and if allowed to speak and you know if you're allowed to listen and have discourse but it's uh, it, it's not easy we never promised you a rose garden but uh, we have to keep fighting not for the abstract principle of democracy it's a necessity it's a necessity for the survival of what little shreds of rights we have to keep those and to advance those and push to the extent that we have those rights it's people who have been struggling women minorities, African Americans for centuries have been struggling, fighting against all sorts of odds, oppression, prejudice, calumny, slander, violence, murder, all these things. Working people have been fighting and fighting. We didn't get the eight hour day on a platter. That took a century of struggle. And in fact, we don't even, we're losing the eight hour day now with forced overtime or forced underemployment or whatever else. <coughs> so um, we are facing very vicious people, very, very vicious people, uh, very relentless in defending their privileges, their power, and their wealth. They will put a bullet through your head if they think you are a, very, a real danger. And so the only safety and security we have is in our numbers, in our organizing, in our speaking out. The one thing you should do, the last thing you should do it, with this censorship is never censor yourself. And there's all sorts of, I've run into too many people in my life who have always told me that the best way to preserve my freedom of speech was to keep my mouth shut. And that didn't make sense. Thanks a lot. This evening we will bring